Hello, uh, natural historians. It's uh, time to talk about statistics. And um, this is difficult, and here's why. Uh, well, uh, uh, everyone struggles with statistics when they first take it. As far as I know, everyone does. And um, I did, and um, then I started teaching statistics. And man, you know what? Stats 108, 109, that's a prerequisite for taking ESM 230, where they talk again about statistics. And then by the time students get to ESM 303, they should know statistics and not need uh, any lecture at all on statistics. And yet, nevertheless, we realize students still do need statistics. So, um, boy, there's there's either we're failing at teaching statistics or there's just something inherently difficult about statistics that just it makes it hard to learn. And remember, I'm going to go with the latter. Um, but anyway, I'm going to proceed with this review of statistics. Now, listen, we've got uh, several different tools here to help you get this. Um, one is this video, and I'm going to go fast because I've got two other things prepared for you. One is um, basically a PowerPoint, it's actually a PDF for you, that Kerry put together that has more detail on the statistics you need to know for this class. Second of all, I went through that and I extracted just the words, just the very basic words that I think are the skeleton or the scaffolding of a user's need for statistics. And I'm going to go through that quickly in this lecture. And so you have multiple tools here to refresh your memory on statistics, or if you're still fuzzy on any of these parts of it, you can go back and study them and use Google and your own re references to get it. Okay, background picture here, a bunch of staples in um, a vertical surface down near uh, uh, Hay Wands Burritos uh, in Northtown. And uh, when, once you start like internalizing your knowledge of statistics, you start seeing the possibilities for statistics anywhere. And I'm, what I see here are a bunch of staples in the board. And I'm kind of curious about those staples. There sure are a lot of them. I wonder how many they are, there are. And I could ask other questions. And I, I wonder how I would use statistics to address this question. And um, I'll return to that question at the end of this lecture. But for now, I'm just going to proceed. Okay, now, uh, first, please remember the following, that in science, there is never certainty, there is only uncertainty. I don't know if you internalized that message before, do so now. Any time you hear a statement that there is X many or X much something in the world, it's a lie. Nobody knows how much or of anything there is anywhere if it's a, not a sense, if it's, if it's a large number. Large numbers are big things like the amount of carbon emitted every year by people, the number of um, swallows that are returning from Mexico every year. Um, those large numbers, there's no certainty in what those numbers are. There's only uncertainty. Well, and that's like counterintuitive because I thought we went to science to get the truth. No, we go to science to reduce our uncertainty and therefore get closer to the truth. How we do that? Well, we want to quantify uncertainty and somehow corral the truth. Um, and here's how. Well, I'm not going to give you a full rundown on how to do that because that's all sampling and statistics stuff you've already had and you're going to do this year in your RES projects. But just a reminder that variation is an attribute of practically everything. Do I have some examples here? I Yeah. First of all, there's the variation that is inherent in nature. When you go into the Arcata Community Forest, um, some trees are close together, others are far apart, so the spacing is different. Some parts will have more salamanders in it than other parts. Um, look at the distribution of ferns. There's variation. This is inherent in nature. There's almost nothing except maybe a crystal lattice in a mineral that is does not have variation in nature. So, okay, great. Thanks for that lesson. I now know that there is variation inherent in everything, and when I the, 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 devise a system for accounting stuff, I need to take that into account. Then, also, there is the variation that comes with experimental error. Since everything we know about the natural world, scientifically, comes from some sort of experiment, such as sampling, we have to acknowledge that there is variation 
that associated with, we will make errors in our experiments. There's no getting around it. Nothing is perfect. Okay, so there's two kinds of variation, the true variation in nature, and then the variation we've added to it by our, our goofing in our sampling. So what we do is we minimize the latter. We try to minimize experimental error. And as you know, technologically, we're always trying to get a better instrument for measuring temperature or distance or whatever. And those are very carefully calibrated by engineers. We don't do that, other people do. But we're always trying to just get better at what we do to minimize experimental error so that we can then um, quantify the former, quantify the variation inherent in nature. And once we've quantified the variation in nature, then we've got the truth on the run. We've got it corralled. We know where the truth is someplace in there. Um, then making estimates based on the known variation, that's tricky. It can be done. But this is just some, some basic background information that you need to know. Cool. All right. Let's talk about my staples again. Um, Look at this, look at the distribution of staples per square unit areas, per square inch or per square meter, whatever you want. And you know, some places are pretty crowded and some places are pretty narrow. And I wonder if down low they're, they're um, crowded and sparse. Maybe down low they're even more sparse. Maybe uh, they're more crowded on this board and down there they're, they're, they're more sparse. I don't know. There's variation in nature and in the nature of this board and these staples. Um, so if it was essential and, or interesting to me to come up with an estimate for the number of staples, well, first of all, I am not going to count all those staples. I suppose I could, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to create an estimate of the number of staples by doing sampling, stuff that you should already know something about and, you pro and will probably be doing soon in your RES. Um, so I would want a system for measuring the number of staples, one that minimizes error, and also is random and has replication, replicability, and so forth. And I would do that to come up with my estimate. Okay, but anyway, the, just a demonstration is there is a true variation in staple density here. And then there's my method for sampling it, which will have some error involved in it, but I want to minimize that error. Okay, so back to the nitty gritty, guys. I'm going to go over this quickly. Um, I have to review this myself all the time. You should review it as well. Um, so uh, Carrie's slide talks a lot about the different kinds of variables. I just wanted to list them here and briefly explain what they are through m using my language. So there's categorical variables and a synonym for categorical is nominal. So I, I remember it this way, like, a no like nominal means uh, like mi nombre, uh, my name, it's a name, not a number. So red, blue, green, th those are names for things. And I might have 12 red, 15 blue, and 26 green things. Those are categories. Or here's nationalities, Filipino, Taiwanese, and Ugandan. Okay, so there's no, these are not numerical, these are not quantitative, they're, oh, they're um, nominal. Now, ordinal is also categorical, it's just that um, they can be put in an order, a, a, a rational order. So the example, a good one, is the Likert scale, which you should know. Um, let's, uh, you know, your opinion on um, how much you like pizza from zero, I hate it, to five, I live for it. Um, so there's an order of how much liking there is. Um, but there's no 1.5, there's no 2.5s, you can't do that. Uh, you don't really know the, like, the distance, what is the distance between a one and a two that's not measurable. So ordinal is a type of categorical, but it's got uh, a logical order to it, whereas categorical has no logical order to it. So these two should go together. You should understand the difference between them. An interval is a numerical value, like um, uh, numerical values with equal intervals along a scale. Uh, you know the distance between the marks on the scale. The values can include zero and negative numbers. So interval is your friend, the, the measuring stick. Uh, or a thermometer. Um, you can have a value of zero if you're measuring something. It has no length at all. Oh, actually, that's not right. That wouldn't work because there's no such thing as being negative tall. Hmm. Um, well, let's stick with thermometers then. So thermometer readings are <laughs> pretty good numerical values with one exception because you, uh, in centigrade and Fahrenheit, you can have negative numbers. Um, 
the, the reason I'm talking about negative numbers is because that's how you distinguish interval from ratio. Ratio is the same as interval, but zero is the starting point. There's no such thing as a negative number. An example there is height. There's no such thing as a negative height. You're either zero or taller. You can't be at negative height. Okay, whereas interval is, is other kind of numerical values. Okay, one, two, three, four. So statistically, where this becomes important, especially is when you come to categorical or ordinal variables. And for these, usually the statistical test you're going to use to test these is a chi-square test. Um, that's kind of why, well, we're putting them out here just because when you start measuring things for your RES, you got to have to think of what kind of variable you're dealing with. The, the number of each bird species in the Arcata Marsh, um, well, that, that would be categorical, categorical data, like different, like different kinds of birds, different species of birds. But whereas if you wanted to, say, measure, I don't know, tree circumference, um, that would be, I guess that would be interval data, right? Uh, no, it would be ratio data. But anyway, the former you'd use chi-square and the other statistical tests you'd use these, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll talk about the statistical tests in a moment. Okay, so just some language stuff. Population uh, is, yeah. <laughs> okay, it's a funny word because in statistics, population is a total number of individuals in a set that is of interest. So you might say, what's the population of redwood trees? And if you're a st statistician, you'd say, where? Like, like in Arcata Community Forest, in Redwood National Park, in the world, which one? Which population are you talking about? Whereas if you go to Joe Blow on the street, um, if you say population, they're gonna think of the number of people. Okay, so uh, in, in ecology, please understand that uh, the term population is individuals in a set that is of interest. So you have to define what that set is before you can talk about the population. A sample is a subset of a population. Uh, so, oh, this word has both a noun and a verb. So um, here is a sample of redwood trees. This area here is a sample that we took from the population, which is the Arcata Community Forest. Or we could sample the Arcata Community Forest population by creating subsets of that population and measuring them, which if you took ESM 230 here, you did. Okay, so just words, get the word straight. A parameter is any attribute of interest to a population, whatever it is, number of feathers, color, um, smell, uh, length, height, frequency. What parameter of Yosemite yellow-legged frogs are you interested in? Many of you are probably thinking about what you're going to do uh, for an RES. And uh, at some point, you may be looking at some populations, and you might be wondering something about them. And you might come up with some particular thing about them you're interested. You're thinking about a parameter. So also, I mean, if you haven't thought of the parameter of interest, time to get thinking about it. OK. And then this word here is weird, because a uh, statistic is an estimate of a parameter. So if you're interested in, I don't know, um, f uh, f relative frequency of males and females in Yosemite yellow-legged frogs, sorry for shoehorning you into a binary sexuality, but I think you do that with frogs or any other sexes of frogs you might find there. Um, that is a statistic, or I could be like, I don't know, length of frogs. That'd be a different kind of statistic. What? I thought you said statistics was a course. Uh, well, <laughs> statistics is the mathematics of calculating statistics. Talk about circular reference. Thank you, English language. We have one, two, three really weird words in this one slide. And I'm sorry, we're just stuck with the imperfection of language. Anyway, learn this. Okay. So I want to talk about the statistical test, but I'm not going to yet because it's important to sort of also, before you even talk about the ANOVA or the t-test, to understand um, what you do before you apply the test and what you do after you do the test. Now, before you apply the test, you need to have a null and alternate hypothesis. Make sure you understand this. 
the null hypothesis is always a statement of no difference. There is no difference. My null hypothesis is there's no difference in the length of yellow-legged frogs in Yosemite and Yellowstone National Parks. I actually think there is, but my null hypothesis, there isn't. All the statistical tests uh, are designed to prove, well, support or reject the null hypothesis. The alternative is always the exact opposite. It's not like uh, Yosemite frogs will have wider nostrils. And the null hypothesis is there's no difference in length. No. If the null hypothesis is there's no difference, then the alternate is there is a difference. Okay, there either is or isn't a difference. There isn't a difference is null. There is a difference is the alternate hypothesis. Make sure you get that. Then you run your test gobbledygook. In the end, there's a p-value. What is the p-value? Well, I'm going to link for you a different lecture on what the p-value is. It is, um, it, the definition of p-value does not stick very well in the human brain. That is my conclusion after teaching this and struggling with this myself for many years. So I developed a, uh, a YouTube video on this, ex on what the p-value is. Uh, if you I suggest you look at it and review the p-value. Okay, the p-value is tied language-wise to this word called significance. So we talk about significant differences between groups or among groups. So uh, usually you're hypothesizing an alternate hypothesis that there is a significant difference between two groups. And the way you determine whether your data support that or not is through the p-value. And so I put this sentence together and I should have ended it. I'm gonna do it now, because I can. Oh no, here it is. Because I'm a language Nazi. Okay, um, there. Our p-value, okay, so here's a sentence and you should like copy and paste this into your RES project at the beginning of your discussion section and then edit it to match your results. You should almost always say something like this. Almost all scientific papers that do sampling, that test a hypothesis, which is pretty much all of them, will have a statement like this in the conclusion. Our p-value is, and you quote the number, 0 0.0003 or 0.4, and that's either above or below 0 0.05, which is the same thing as 5%. Therefore, we either reject or fail to reject our null hypothesis. And we conclude that there is or there is not a significant difference or association between among our populations or our variable. Okay, so I put a lot of alternate phrasing in here, but you pretty much, this sentence should work for you after you edit it. Remember, a p-value below 0.05 means you reject your null hypothesis. Yay, there is a difference, is your conclusion. A p-value above 0.5, like uh, this is uh, above 0.5, and we cannot reject our null hypothesis. And then you go on to discuss what all that means and speculate about you know, why and future research and so forth. But, um, you should be able to edit this sentence after you've run your statistical test and write your conclusion. Why is 0.05 a magic number? That should be described in that other video I'm going to link to you for you. And um, you should get that in your brain and be able to express that in your own language. It's complicated, but it's powerful and worth knowing. Okay, and then here's a statistical test you need to know. Uh, the t-test, the ANOVA, linear regression, chi-square, boom, study them. t-test, comparing two means, ANOVA, single factor, comparing more than two means, two factors means uh, more than different, more than one factor among multiple populations. Linear regression is, uh, you know, a scatter plot. You do correlation, then you do, um, you put in the trend line, you put in the R value, the R square value, it should rate the the R squared value ranges from zero to one, but I like the R value better because it ranges from minus one to one, minus one being perfect, let's see, from your point of view, perfect negative correlation, zero perfect positive correlation. Uh, actually, it's not zero, it would be a cloud. Okay, um, and the, in 230, I don't know if you learned this, but um, 
Um, there is a test of significance for regression, and it's called the F-test for regression. Then there's the chi-square, a little bit intuitively trickier, I think, than the other ones, where you're just comparing the means of some parameter between two populations. The chi-square is when you might not have means. You have frequencies of occurrences among categorical variables. So here's an example for you. There you are. Well, I went so fast there on purpose because you can study this on your own. You don't need me to tell you what they are. And if you do, then come talk to me and I will slow down and I really sh sh tell you. Now, um, here's some advice to you, those of you who are thinking of doing an RES project, if you're in the early stages of an RES project. I suggest that you spend some time, let's say you formulated some kind of question. Do not dive into the methods and how you're going to test that and everything, but instead think of at the end of what I do, what is the chart that I want to make at the end? You're going to probably want to make a chart with some bar graphs or some dots in a scatter plot or something like that. And think about that and think hard about that and draw it down, sketch it out with pencil and paper. Once you've done that, you can think, hey, what statistical test can I use to tell whether the differences in these bars are significant or not, or whether the association between two variables that I've been measuring is significant or not. That's called reverse design, and it's a very powerful way of designing um, scientific experiments. So think about doing that. Okay, so uh, let's see. I just want to say a few more words before saying goodbye about the staples. Um, so let's say I was really interested in human behavior as a, a exhibited by their putting staples in public places. And uh, let's say uh, all around a town, um, there were different places where people putting, were putting staples. And I wanted to know if they're all, like some people put more staples in some places than others. My alternative hypothesis is that there is a difference in the frequency or the density of staples um, done in areas downtown versus uh, towards the outskirts of town or near H Street or going away from H Street. So I would identify a number of different places and then I would want to sample this. So um, my uh, parameter is going to be staples per square meter. And my statistic, hmm, I'm going to compare just the means of two populations. Uh, you know what? My first population is going to be the population here. And if I had another board somewhere, if I did two boards, I would do the ANOVA test. I'm sorry, the T test. If I had multiple boards, that would be the ANOVA. If I was testing both um, uh, uh, staple density and also staple age, that's two different parameters. That would be two factor ANOVA. If I was going to test the, the, the frequency of staples and the frequency of flyers, I don't know. I'm trying to dream up of a chi-square test and I can't do it on the fly, um, but that's enough. Okay, so um, that's a quick review, 23 minutes. That's all. Do this. You've got other resources available to you to review on statistics. Do it now. Also review back this stuff later when you get to doing the own, your own statistics in your RES. Okay, thank you, goodbye.